for anyone who has even a passing familiarity with the NBA, you know who Sean Bradley is. The seven foot six guy who was a very unique player one year out of BYU. He was a very well known player. Always seemed like such a nice guy and the bits of media of him that I consumed. And so hearing about someone of that stature, what had happened to him, it, it shook me definitely because you think about what that would have done to the rest of his life, to his family. And it, you start asking questions and obviously you feel bad. But as a reporter, you start thinking immediately about maybe one day he's going to want to tell this story about what's happened to him. I found out like the rest of the public, and that was very intentional on the Bradley's part. They were able to keep it under wraps for quite some time. Then you are in Australia right now. You're talking NBA basketball. You're talking great teams. You're talking great individual players. Takes it off and there's number 23. And of course, Johnny goes nuts. So we're all getting first time thinking about it now. I just tried to go out there and play my game. I have no idea what you're talking about, Adam. I don't like anybody. I'm not a people person. Strand, he made the pass. Yes. Christian, can you catch the ball? Yes. All the stars were aligned and all the muscles fired at the right time. And I was able to get off the ground and throw one down. I was saving that as a surprise for you. And now, introducing your host for In All Airness, Adam Ryan. Welcome to episode 129. Thanks for joining me. Today, I'm pleased to welcome Brian Burnsed. Brian is a contributing writer for Sports Illustrated and is based in Florida. In this conversation, we do a deep dive into the process behind his brilliant yet sobering profile on 12-year NBA veteran Sean Bradley. Existing fans of my show will likely know that I've been a big fan of Sean's since 1994. I briefly elaborate on my fandom during this chat. However, we largely cover how Brian's excellent profile came to be, his process throughout, its impact on him, and of course, how Sean's terrible accident has forever changed the course of not only his life, but that of his family. On a lighter note, towards the end of the episode, I'll share what may be the most amusing podcast review yet. If you can spare a moment, please add your review via Apple Podcasts. See the reviews link on my website or your listening app of choice if it allows. It would be most appreciated. Show notes for this episode and access to a huge archive of past episodes are available at inallairness.com. Now, onto the show. My guest today is a narrative journalist, sports reporter, and storyteller. He's a contributing writer for Sports Illustrated and recently completed an in-depth profile on the plight of seven foot six Sean Bradley, the number two pick of the 1993 NBA draft. Bradley was involved in a terrible accident in 2021 after a car hit his custom-made bike just minutes from his home in St. George, Utah. Brian Byrne said, thanks for joining me. Happy to be here. Thanks so much for your interest in the piece. I appreciate you coming on to talk about this fantastically written piece. It's uh, very sobering, but a great read. Even though he spent two years here in Australia, and we'll get to that shortly, I first became aware of Sean Bradley during the 1993 NBA season. He was regularly mentioned in broadcasts about the impending 1993 NBA draft. When do you first recall hearing Sean's name, Brian? I was a little younger then, so I didn't know him around the time he was being drafted, but I do remember vividly, I believe it was early high school, so this would have been around 2000 or so. I obviously knew of him before this, but the first time I saw him in person, I, I grew up in suburban Atlanta and was a Hawks, and still am a Hawks fan, and so I went to a game, and it was Mavericks-Hawks, and Sean was on the Mavericks set. I think he was the starting setter. Maybe he's come off the bench then. He was still a prominent player for them. And I remember vividly in pregame warmups watching him stand flat footed and reach up with two hands and grab the rim to stretch. I played basketball in high school. I've been around the sport a long time and I was just stunned. I had never, ever in my life seen anything like that. Funnily enough, when I talked to him in the interviews for the piece, I brought that up to him and he said, yeah, he did it to stretch, but part of it was to intimidate as well, to let the other team serve them as a reminder. Hey, I'm seven, six, this is how high you're going to have to get to try to be a little bit more of an intimidating defender. That's great. I love that. That's good to hear that sort of stuff. 1991 was Sean's only season of college basketball. He played for Brigham Young University, and he averaged almost 15 points, eight rebounds, and more than five blocks per game. And that was in only 29 minutes of game time. He led the nation in blocks per game, ahead of such luminaries, including 
at the college level, Shaquille O'Neal, Dikembe Mutombo, Jim McIlvane, and Australia's own Luke Longley. Now, Sean played 34 games in total with the BYU Cougars. They went 21 and 13. However, after that freshman season, he flew to Australia to serve a two-year Mormon church mission. Here's an excerpt from a 1991 Associated Press article which was titled Bradley Picks Australia over NBA Draft Payoff and it says, quote, The mission made by most Mormon males at age 19 means basketball will take a back seat along with dating, television, movies and parties for the next 24 months. When you were speaking to Sean as part of this piece, did you speak much about his time in Australia and the impact that his Mormon faith has on his life overall? We definitely did. That was definitely a, a big decision. You rattled off those college stats. Just a remarkable player. Obviously, I was going to be a high lottery pick. Could have played more and developed his game in college. He just played the one season and opted for his faith's sake to, to take that, that mission trip where he'd been placed all the way in Australia, a long way from home, somewhere from small town Utah. But he came to absolutely love it. He, he loved the people. He loved his time there so much. So what really struck me on that front was that later in life with his new wife and the three children he adopted, they went back because I think it, it made such an impression on him. So yeah, Australia was an important part of his life. He didn't really play basketball then. It kind of got in the way of what he's known for, so to speak. But I think that speaks to who he is as a person holistically where life He's a talented basketball player, a long NBA career. That's not easy to do, but his life was bigger than just basketball. And I think his time in Australia is a perfect example of that. Now, your SI piece is titled Life After Seven Foot Six. Sean Bradley, paralyzed in a bike crash, knows it'll never be the same. Post NBA career, Sean has largely been private and seemingly was very content with living life as normal as possible for somebody of his stature, away from the spotlight. I first learnt of his terrible accident. The crash itself happened in January of 2021. It was made public in March. It was such a shock when I first read it across Twitter. How did you actually first hear of Sean's accident at that time, Brian? Much in the same way you did. I found out, I think it was on Twitter. I think it trended that day. It was obviously shocking for anyone who has even a passing familiarity with the NBA. You know who Sean Bradley is. The seven foot six guy who was a very unique player and one year out of BYU, he was a very well-known player and always seemed like such a nice guy and, and the bits of media of him that I consumed. And so hearing about someone of that stature, what had happened to him, it, it shook me definitely because you think about what that would have done to the rest of his life, to his family, and it, you start asking questions and obviously you feel bad, but as a reporter, you start thinking immediately about maybe one day he's going to want to tell this story about what's happened to him. So yeah, I found out like the rest of the public and that was very intentional on the Bradley's part. They were able to keep it under wraps for quite some time, in large part thanks to COVID, because access to the hospital was cut off and people were bunkered down around that time. So they were able to keep it private until they were ready to come forward statement with the Mavericks in March. Just for a bit of background, in 1994, with a group of other Australians, I headed over on an NBA tour, six games in two weeks, and two of those games were Philadelphia 76ers contests. So I got to see Sean play twice, once against the Chicago Bulls in Chicago, and then once at Madison Square Garden against Patrick Ewing and the New York Knicks. So they were massive highlights of my trip, and I was so enamored by Sean at the time that I purchased one of his champion jerseys, number 76 for Philadelphia. So I've always been a fan of Sean's going back to 1994. I had a particular attachment to him, and when I read that news of the crash, I was absolutely stunned. Just for context, through your piece, Sean remarried in 2017 to a woman named Carrie, Now, you write of Sean, quote, he has been a stable force in four lives previously beset by chaos, and he adopted her three children, and he has six children from his previous marriage. However, you add that Sean is largely estranged from them, unfortunately. You alluded to it briefly a moment ago, but at what point did you consider reaching out to Sean and even just his inner circle about the possibility of doing a profile on what actually had happened? That's a great question. I have a wealth of experience with tackling difficult stories like this one where you're going to walk up to something sensitive, something private. Uh, and so I knew that's not something that they're going to be receptive to right away. They even said it in the press release. We hope this answers every question. We're not taking any media inquiries at the time. And I respect that. 
I'm not there to get the quick hit news piece. I'm there to do the, the thoughtful feature well after the fact when they're ready to talk. So I gave it some time. I think maybe by that summer, I started putting some feelers out into his camp and got feedback faster than I thought I would that, hey, we think he might be receptive to this at some point as a means of one, telling the story because everyone's asking, and two, as a means of connecting with others in comparable situations where we are just become defined by one's a caretaker, one's being taken care of, or to help with other people in bike crashes, or to help with other people facing quadriplegia. But it still took some time. It took until from those first few calls, feeling them out, then feeling me out, more importantly, until about the fall when I got uh, the green light to get on the phone with Sean and just have a informal off the record chat, get to know each other, if you felt comfortable with me. And thankfully he did. That's a little some of my past work. And I think that helped assuage him and his any apprehensions they had that we try to handle as tactfully as we could. From there, was able to set up some trips to see him in Dallas and in Utah. Great background on this. Thank you for sharing it. How long do you spend researching ahead of the writing process? What were you doing in advance of your first in-person meeting with Sean and family? That's a good question. And that's the most important part as you start the process is research. So I run a pretty thorough search of news clips, magazine clips, newspaper, as much as I can get my hands on. Because even though this story is a far reaching one, this was going to be zoomed in pretty intimately on the past year or so of his life with the accident. We weren't getting into Sean's career that, that it had chronicled. It wasn't necessarily entirely relevant to the story, though some elements were. I still want to know who he is, what's been written about him. So I spend quite a bit of time reading, researching, compiling everything into a single document that's an encapsulation of Sean since he's been in the public eye. And I spend a lot of time with that going in so that I feel like I at least have a sense of his public face. You don't know anyone until you meet him. But I know who he is because you don't want to be caught flat-footed in lengthy conversations. You want them to appreciate that you've done your work and your late work and you you know what's publicly available about that's step one. And then, and then yes, you go in step two is start with the in-person. For listeners who are yet to read the profile, what actually unfolded on the day of Sean's accident? He's got a custom-built bike. He rides it quite frequently and has, since he's been retired, as you could imagine, and as the case with most former NBA players, their joints, knees, back start to ache. Just has a lot of pounding, and it's even more so when you're seven, six, 300 pounds. So you've got to find a way to exercise. And, and he gained some weight after retirement. It fell in love with biking as a means that it helped him mentally as a way to decompress and it helped keep him in shape and keep his weight down. Then he did a lot of hundred mile rides and he tailed off the, the more extreme rides as he got into his late forties, but he still rode regularly for exercise in his home in St. George, Utah. It's a beautiful place. The weather's good year round. It's not snowy Utah like you might think of where the jazz are in Salt Lake in Southern Utah. The climate is a little more temperate. And so it was January and beautiful day out, sun's out a little crisp out for one of his usual afternoon rides. He had just come through a roundabout. It's a two-lane road. There's a, a wide emergency lane on his right. There's a car parked fully in the emergency lane, but he's straddling the, the far right lane line and is worried, oh, if there's someone in that car and they open their driver door, that's bad news. That's going to be tumbling I want to. So he signaled, as you should, that he was coming into the lane to get around the car, and there was a car behind him. Unfortunately, that driver was either not paying attention or was in a hurry or a mix of both and didn't give him the room that, that you're supposed to as you're passing. Bumped him, that bumped him into the parked car, turned his front wheel sharply to the right when the handlebar caught on the car, then him catapulting through the air, and he landed hard on the street, and that's where his vertebrae shifted, final court pinched. You visited the crash site with Sean and his family, and in a cruel twist, it's only walking distance from the Bradley's home. What was that experience like? How did you prepare yourself to head to the scene of where the crash happened? That was interesting because I don't think they had not all gone out together to see it. Harry and the kids had done it as kind of a cleansing thing to go out there without him when he was in the hospital. But as far as all of them going out to look at it and sit and reflect, I don't think they'd done it until I went out there with them. I wanted to be able to depict it accurately in the piece I wanted to see it. And they they walked out there and Sean went in his electric wheelchair along with us. And it was maybe five minute walk or so, really close to home. They weren't emotional in that moment. I think that they were keen on really piecing together what happened, painting a, a nice picture for me to understand what happened where. And that really helped me in writing the piece that they were so willing to show me. This is where this awful accident happened. They, they didn't seem terribly traumatized by it. I think because they'd had time, I was with them not quite a year since the accident, but close to it. And they had 
had time to process and digest. And that's a street that they all used coming and going. And they have to pass that. For a while, Carrie said that she went around it. There's another way out of their neighborhood where that she'd go another way to avoid it. And eventually they came to terms with it. And that's something that they drive past. How important was Carrie in relation to this story coming to be? I know that she provided several photos which have been used in the piece itself. What was her importance to the story, but also her importance to the family unit and her strength and caregiving now that she gives to Sean himself? I think that she was probably instrumental behind the scenes and and maybe nudging Sean to open up. She's such a relentlessly positive person and was always searching for happiness and silver linings, even in dealing with such difficulty. And she's so outgoing. I'm sure she had some apprehension. She'd never done any sort of media thing. And this is a pretty big first time you talk to someone that's for a Sports Illustrated story that's going to get picked up across the world. She was very candid. And and I think her enthusiasm has helped Sean be comfortable and opening up to people like me and to the world in general. He had to have a lot of time to reflect and get accustomed to his new identity. But once he was ready to talk, they didn't hold back. And I think a lot of credit goes to her for that. He would say as much as well. Or they just felt like they need to be open and honest so that other people in situations like that can relate. And to your second question, she is just so essential to, I think the way we phrase it, the piece was not only keeping me alive, but making life worth living because, and he said as much to me where her constant happy spirit helps keep them going. He can get really down and has, especially early on, as you're adjusting to this drastically different life, you're the tallest guy in the room, everyone looks up to you, and now you're not. You're the exact opposite. How do you cope? It helps to have a partner who will help you find the light and all that darkness, all that fog. And she's done that for him. And that's not to say it doesn't wear on her, the many, many tasks. Her life changed too. She has had down moments along the way, but by and large, she's a positive force. And Sean just feels so indebted to her. What was the most difficult part of the story to write from your perspective? It's a good question. I think it was in reporting and writing it, and it's what I wanted to get at the most in approaching the story is how does it affect marriage, right? How do you, with your partner, those dynamics shift instantly overnight and now one is a caretaker and one has to rely on you in very different ways than you rely on someone in a marriage. And so having to ask them questions about how those dynamics have shifted and going to therapy and how they have date nights and how do you maintain the spark, the reason you get married, the reason you stay together and have that sort of relationship, how do you maintain even a sliver of that? when there's just all logistics of caretaking and responsibilities. That was hard to walk up to in the questions, though they were very open and honest about it, and I appreciated that. And then in writing, that was something I wanted to be sure to try to capture. And that's probably the most emotional part of the reporting and writing process, trying to get that just right. It's a sensitive subject, and I think a lot of people out there are in similar enough situations that can empathize with that. I wanted to get that right. How have you found reaction to the pace? Frankly, overwhelming on the positive side. It's one of the most read stories Sports Illustrated has done in the last several years. And you don't write for clicks. You don't write to generate a huge audience. You write to try to tell a good story. But I just think that speaks to uh, how Sean and his vulnerability and his openness and honesty, along with Carrie, how that has resonated with people. That's credit to them for being vulnerable and putting themselves out in a situation and, and letting others know that, hey, if you're feeling down or you're in a comfortable spot like this. Someone like Sean with this charmed life. Yeah, he's going through it too. And here's what it looks like. Here's what it feels like. That's really blown me away. Just the amount of well wishes that I've gotten via email or Twitter from people that are saying like, hey, can you reach out to Sean for me? Can you pass this along to Sean? It's well wishes or here's this medical device that might help them. I'm gathering all that. I'm going to send them to the Bradleys. And I'm sure they've gotten 10 times as much as I've gotten. In any story I've ever written, I've never gotten this feedback like this. Certainly you do interviews, you get stuff like that. I mean, but as far as the kind of human connection and feedback I've gotten for people that want to reach out and help, I agree. It's, you know, made me feel good as the writer who was able to bring this, this story forward, but it definitely makes me want to carry because I know they'll get to read all that and hopefully it brings them up in the middle. In the face of so much adversity, it is definitely a positive to hear that. I'd just like to quickly read a, a tweet from Jim McElvain, who's a former NBA veteran. He's a fellow big man that played in the NBA at the same time as as Sean. As a follow-up to your story, he wrote, and I'm quoting him here, a woman effectively obliterated the life Sean Bradley knew. Sean has gone out of his way to conceal her identity and protect her from terrible and useless harassment. I wish more people in our country were strong enough to follow Sean's example 
and extend such grace to others. Now, very strong quote there, and I agree with Jim. Given your interactions with Sean and family, what does that say about Sean's immense grace in the face of so much adversity? I'm so glad you raised that. Of all the reaction I've seen to the piece, that was one of the strongest, I think, most poignant. I think it says everything you need to know about who Sean is. If I was in that scenario, if many of us were in that scenario, I think it would be hard not to be angry all of the time, like some measure of vengeance. They didn't sue when the police opted not to bring charges for whatever reason, despite the evidence being pretty clear that, that she had, had bumped him and caused the accident. Despite all that, they didn't try to press charges or sue. They didn't try to bring your name into the media. You can find it. It's available. We had it. We had that discussion. No, Sean doesn't want it out there. And as a means of conveying who he is, we'll withhold it too to show you, well, here's how Sean feels about it. And like he said in the tweet, it shows you the grace. It shows you his personality. It shows you that he's just focused on moving forward and doesn't want to disparage others. Certainly, he could have framed this very differently and she could be going through a very different circumstance right now in the wake of the story of his approach to that had been different. His attitude towards her had been different. He opted to move on, which, gosh, given the circumstances, how in the world do you do that? I think that says so much about who he is. Excellently said. The added dilemma that Sean faced following the crash was his incredible height. It opened up unprecedented factors that need to be considered going forwards. What is continuing to be involved in terms of challenges that Sean and family face day to day? Great question. That's at the heart of the story. Okay, it's not just someone that's now quadriplegic. That happens sadly quite a bit, but it's someone who's quadriplegic that's also seven foot six, now up to about 350 pounds. How in the world do you manage that as a medical provider, as a therapist, as a family? Right. That struggle will be ongoing. It took him three months to get his custom electric wheelchair built that could handle his size, built to accommodate his size. And then it also tilts. He's got to do that to regulate his blood pressure, get it tilt and support his weight safely. Together, he and the chair weigh about 800 pounds. In normal situations like this, you have a custom-made van or minivan where you can have a lift and pull someone in. Well, Sean's so big, they have to buy a sprinter-sized cargo van in order to transport. Custom-made beds, custom-made shower chair. At his home, I saw it. It's massive. Even seated, he's taller than his wife. He's still in the, he could adjust the height. I'm 6'6". Six, six. He was taller than me when he added all the way up. Sometimes he cruises around with it lower, but just his hands and feet. He is a massive, massive human. It's tough to appreciate until you see him in person. And to see him in that scenario where maneuverability is an issue in that chair, right? We have that scene in this story where they try to go to the movies and carry us to go on a reconnaissance mission to figure out if he can fit, how, and what entrance they'll use. And so... Because of his size, life is just going to be a string of logistical challenges like that. It's already hard enough if you are quadriplegic in an electric wheelchair. That's plenty to face. But then when you have to worry about, do even handicap accommodations work for me everywhere you go? It's just doubly difficult. One of the photos that was provided by Carrie was Sean in his hospital bed in the early stages. And his feet extend so far over the bed and even perhaps like another table with some sort of soft cushioning on it, his feet are overhanging that too. Yeah, it was remarkable. I was so glad I got to speak with this physician that was in charge of the rehab team because he gave me so much great detail. And you could just see it on his face, just how he was still flabbergasted that they were able to improvise in so many different ways in that first four month stint in the hospital to try to make life comfortable for him, to make rehab safe, effective. They had to recalibrate all their processes that normally they have a quick planning meeting and you're off. They know what they're doing, they're professionals, but this took weeks of planning to figure out how to accommodate. It's sobering, of course, but fascinating to hear the -the behind-the-scenes things that go into making this story. How did your reporting of this story impact you personally, Brian? That's a great question. So it definitely, it makes you realize you need to not take anything for granted. So Sean... He had an enviable life. He's retired. He's got this family that adores him. He has a beautiful home in a beautiful part of the country and has accomplished so much, not just on the court, but he's worked as a vice principal at a school for troubled youth. He's, he's done important things in basketball and beyond. Sort of life that we would all envy. And then boom, in an instant, it's totally different. Completely 180. I'd get back from those days reporting with him and I'd call my wife up from the hotel in Dallas or in Utah and just talk about what I'd seen and how thankful I was that we were healthy and that we were okay. 
and that continues to have a profound impact on me every day. You just don't know. It's cliche. I hate cliches as a writer, but you try to enjoy life in every moment, every day, as much as you can. That's a, that's a big takeaway. That's easier said than done. You're going to get stressed. Life is life, but it definitely gives you perspective that if this can happen to Sean Bradley, treasure what you have. Seeing what it's like when something like that is taking place, it's really hard. I appreciate you opening up about it. I know it's obviously a difficult topic to cover and you've done an extremely good job of doing that. I'll include a link in the show notes to this episode for people to go to the Sports Illustrator website and to your website itself so people can find out more about you and your writing. Is there anything at all that we haven't covered in the conversation that you'd like to make mention of, Brian? I would say that Sean, while he didn't shy away from the difficulties, Carrie didn't shy away from the difficulties, they are remarkably hopeful moving forward. They hope to try to have an impact in some way on other people that find themselves in these situations or on road safety for cyclists. They're still in the early stages of looking at what shape that might take. They're still getting used to their own drastically different new lives. But I think the article and him wanting to get the story out is step one in many in trying to leverage what happened to him for some some measure of good, which given the character we discussed earlier that he has long shown, that's no surprise. But that's just something to keep your eye on. The story is not the definitive, the end to Sean Bradley's life. We can empathize and can't feel bad, but they're going to try to find some hope and good. Definitely. It's been great just to have a chance to speak with you and, and go into depth about how this piece came together. I really do appreciate your time today, Brian, and I wish you all the best going forwards. And, and thanks again for just being a part of the show today. Happy to. Thanks so much for the time and for reading and for all the great questions. I appreciate the chance to talk about it in depth. Thanks for listening. I welcome your interaction with the show. Tap the microphone icon on my website to send me a voicemail. You can suggest discussion topics or guests you'd like to hear conversations with. Time now to share another great review from a fan of the show. Thanks to Michael Jordan. I don't think it's the Michael Jordan via Apple Podcasts in the United Kingdom. And it's titled MJ Podcast Review and is rated five stars. It reads, I love this podcast. It literally helps me go to sleep. I'm also in the UK, so there's not much basketball talk here, but when there is, it feels good. This podcast makes me happy. Please make more. Good job, mate. And then he's got four clapping hands emojis and a couple of basketballs. So good stuff there, MJ. Thanks, mate. I don't think it's the Michael Jordan. Much appreciated, and it gave me a good laugh. I do often say to people that the podcast can be great for insomniacs, so I guess in this case, it's worked well for Michael Jordan of the UK. Worldwide, the show has 192 ratings on Apple Podcasts with an average of 4.9 stars with 100 reviews across all providers. Thanks for your continued support. If you had a review, I'd love to read it out on a future episode. Your ratings and reviews are one of the best ways to support the podcast. If you enjoy the show, please tell your basketball-loving friends about it. Word-of-mouth recommendations are truly worth their weight in gold. Stay up to date with my podcast and subscribe to my free NBA History newsletter. You'll receive exclusive details on upcoming episodes, future guests to appear on the show, and more. Sign up via my website or simply email me in all earnest at gmail.com. You can follow my show in various ways. Search in all earnest, three words, on your listening app of choice. The show is available on most platforms. Check the podcast archive for plenty more episodes with a great range of guests. My Instagram and Twitter handle is at In All Anus. Search In All Anus on YouTube and Facebook too. Join me next time for another edition of the show.